In this episode of Page to Screen Roundtable Discussions, viewer discretion is advised, as some topics may be triggering and unsuitable for younger audiences. Please be sure to check the trigger warnings in the description below. All right, so welcome. <laughs> it's me, Tammy, from The World According to Tammy, and I have a familiar face if you are familiar with my channel. Hi, I am Megan. I'm from The Book Attic, where my kittens will know me from. And today we are doing something that kind of takes us back to our roots. Yeah, so when we started, we were doing um, talking movies together. We really liked that. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of separated. We're doing our own things. Um, Meg was doing books. I'm still doing movies. But we kind of missed that collaboration. And so we are back together doing what we're calling a page to screen adaptation. Um, and we're going to be talking about books that have been um, adapted into television, uh, movies, things like that, or books that we wish would be adapted. That's kind of where we're at for this first one. Um, we are still kind of figuring out the kinks for these roundtable discussions, which I don't know if you can see this, but the table here is round. <laughs> so we're not quite the bitches of the roundtable. <laughs> Oh, we're gonna have to bleep that <laughs> that's okay but uh, anyway so we are just wanting to do some fun discussions about the things that we're both passionate about and I've missed filming with you like crazy so the this same. is a good thing for us yeah and what better one to start with than the book that we are both obsessed with the series yes that kind of just cemented that, oh, okay, you're my person. I'm going to call you if I have a dead body in my living room kind of person, you know? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Just um, throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, we both um, love police procedurals. And mm -hmm. this is, and also sci-fi. So this yes. is a blend of both of them. And it is In Death, the In Death series by uh, famed novelist J.D. Robb also known as Nora Roberts, for those bibliophiles out there. And this series is over 50 books strong, you guys. She is seriously got the magic formula. She's very prolific. She puts out at least three books a year, sometimes more. And at least and two of those are going to be part of this series every year. Yeah. Um, she has 50 books plus some short story anthologies, which we're not even discussing. We're no. just discussing the 50 plus books. Main story books. Um, and one of the fun things that we want to do today is we're going to cast the first novel because we want to see it brought to either the little screen or the big screen, one of the two. It has so much potential and it needs to happen. Absolutely. So starting with the actual book itself, it's called Naked in Death and it tells the story of Eve Dallas. A homicide detective who is struggling in her job she ends up coming off of a really horrible case and being pulled into another one where a senator's granddaughter has been brutally murdered and she will do everything she can to solve it but getting in her way is the very handsome and delicious Rourke the billionaire business mogul who has a very shady past and is someone Eve really shouldn't be tangling with. But together, they will become this great epic thing. Yeah. So one of the things about this series is you can pretty much pick up any book in this series, but we recommend at least reading the first three. Absolutely. That's where you're going to get your base. You're going to meet your core characters. And honestly, I think I fell in love with the entire series by book two. I loved it first one, but yeah, the by book three, you're now in it, and mm -hmm. all of our main characters are um, have been really introduced, and we are brought into the world of the NYPSD, which is the New York Police and Security Department, mm -hmm. in 2060. 20 um, well 2058. The first one is 2058, but then it goes into the 2060s. So one of the nice things is it's, it is very formulaic in the sense that it is a police procedural. Mm -hmm. But uh, whereas if you were watching, say, Law and Order, it, um, 
the characters change every book and they grow, they grow in every story. And that's really important, especially if you're going to have a story that goes or a series that goes on this long because you don't want to just be sitting there reading the same book over and over. There is so much character development that happens gradually. There are some huge focuses on growth in certain books. Not all of them. All of them do tell an overall story, but like Tammy was saying, you can pretty much pick up any one after the first three or four-ish and read it from there. You may get confused on a couple of things, but really it's kind of, you can gloss over them for the most part. Yeah. There, what I like is the story is internally consistent. Exactly. Pretty much. Um, one of the things that's kind of funny is they're called yammies. Uh, yet another Nora inconsistency. Ah. There are certain things that hardcore fans of the series will pick out and just say, hey, this was this in one book and then this in another. And it's just something so freaking tiny that it doesn't really affect anything, but it's kind of fun. Good to know. I had no idea. But it, that's the last thing I focused on when I was doing the last listen to because I'm obsessed with the audiobooks. Susan Erickson is an amazing audiobook narrator. Just saying, there's a plug. We are not sponsored by Audible, but check it out. We would love to be sponsored by Audible. We would love it. Hint, hint. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that being said, one of the things that I really like about the story, I'm a huge sci-fi junkie. I love sci-fi. Um, but when this started back in the early to mid-90s, um, she was prescient, almost, in terms of some of the... Things that we are seeing now that she was writing about in the 90s, talking about stuff that was happening in another 40 years. Mm -hmm. So um, if that's not mind bending, I don't know what it is. Um, One of the big things is the urban wars. The urban wars. And that's where I was going with that. So the urban wars were a series of a global um, uprising in and. It not just affected the United States, but literally a global um, war. You know, urban versus rural versus the haves, the haves nots, which is very prescient now, which is in the story, the the urban wars happened in about 2020. <laughs> Look at where we are now. Especially with the Black Lives Matter, the Capitol riots. There's a lot that is very relevant in terms of how the stuff that happened in the story is, is definitely holding up a mirror to our society. So that's one of the things that I like. I wish, personally, as um, a fan of the series, that we would go more into the urban wars, but can't have everything that we want. <laughs> exactly. You never know, though. They may do throw in a book here or there about it and have to solve like a murder that happened during... No, no, no. Oh, that would be kind of mind-bending. That would be fun. Um, so one of the things that I love about the story, I love sci-fi. One of my favorite movies is a sci-fi movie. We're not going to go into that because that's not what today is about. But there are some awesome things in this world. The auto, auto chef. chef. I want one so bad. So, so bad. It makes your food for you. Yeah. And I hate cooking, but I love to eat. So anything that I can do to make my life easier be, and allow me to be lazy when it comes to food preparation, I am mm -hmm. all for it. Auto chef's rule. I want one so bad. <laughs> so, so bad. Another thing that's kind of fun but terrifies me at the same time because, hello, Skynet, uh, Terminator fans out there, you know what I'm talking about, um, are the droids, the androids. Yeah, well, I mean, with what the technology that is happening now, especially in Japan when it comes to um, the the robots that they're building, the um, AI technology that is happening right now um, with facial recognition, all that kind of stuff, it is very part of the world that we are in now, mm -hmm. but it's also very part of the world of um, the yeah. in-depth. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's so much going for this series that we could sit here and we could talk for hours about every little detail and we would be just happy as clams here. But let's move into the casting choices. Oh, we're not there yet. Not there yet? No. Oh, I'm jumping the gun. You okay. are. <laughs> we're what, not. Are, what are we doing now? 
Um, the unrealistic expectations when it comes oh, to relationships. I'm sorry. I don't have that problem because I am asexual. You, however, are. Um, I don't know about you, but th- this book definitely has a lot of sex. I'm okay with that. But there is definitely that unrealistic expectation where we're just like, gosh darn it. <laughs> Why can't I meet somebody like Rourke? Or any of the characters in there because they're almost perfect, but not quite. Mm-hmm. But they ha- they definitely have their quirks and things that are just very, like, mm. but. Yes. Um, another thing, I'm glad you stopped me because I would have just trucked ahead and we would have missed something that's huge in the in-depth world. Licensed companions. Yes. So... Basically, prostitution is legal, which um, I think is a fantastic idea. Um, mm-hmm. Well, they, they're they screened and regulated, and you have to be licensed. And it's for their protection as much as their client's protection. Yeah, that, and, that's the thing that I feel bad about um, sex workers now, is that... It's so stigmatized. It is. Still. And there is no, you know it's considered illegal they have no um legal uh protections and if they are attacked or beaten or something like that they they can't say anything and this is also why um sex workers are often victims of violent crimes because Mm -hmm. they are they're they're very vulnerable and they're still I think there's an innate vulnerability that happens with somebody who's a sex worker, but they at least have the protections in this world. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I really liked was the fact that um, men and women are both considered um, licensed companions. They Mm -hmm. can be, and they can be, they can choose to be licensed for men or women or both or groups or anything and the the therapy part is also Mm -hmm. considered a big deal so much like um you know professional sex therapists that's kind of what they are Mm -hmm. on top of the sex yes and like i was saying it it's been stigmatized being a licensed companion i'm not going to say the actual word here um, that we use in our everyday world, um, it's the oldest profession. I mean, it's talked about in the Bible. Yeah. But there's such that stigma about it that just drives me crazy. But one thing that I do think, you know, we're kind of heading in the right direction is people claiming their sexuality, sexuality, confidence, independence through sites like OnlyFans. They get to dictate what they do. And I'm all for if it makes you feel good, feel confident, and you're not hurting anybody, and well, you're not doing anything with people who are too young, you are good. Yeah. You know? Well, and they have that control over their own bodies. I mean, exactly. we are in society today, there's definitely, especially here in the United States, mm-hmm. there is definitely, um, I hate to say it, a rather puritanical culture when it comes to sex Mm -hmm. and you know here in the state of utah um i have teenagers well they're not teenagers anymore but they were going considered one of them but not much longer Mm -hmm. they went through the health um you know health courses that are required but instead of actually teaching positive sex um and history it was abstinence only i'm like that is not that's gonna not cut it education that's not gonna cut it because kids are curious they're gonna want to try things out and if you don't teach them to be safe then things are gonna happen and you're gonna have grandkids way too early for one yeah and the other thing is STDs. yeah they're yeah it's not safe whereas there's study after study of places that teach about safe sex and all of that the sex, the number of STDs, pregnancies, and premarital sex, drastically falls. Tumble, tumble, because kids are like, oh, well, they don't need to know. They've they've been taught it, and mm-hmm. I think that is really cool. However, yeah. one of the things that 
in this story that this it is something to be aware of um it, throughout the entire series is um eve was abused as a child yes. and so there is definitely um there are some darker themes i mean obviously it's a police procedural kind of story but this is Deals with things along the lines of Law and Order SVU. Very much so. Um, so just keep that in mind if you decide you want to pick it up. It is definitely not suitable for younger readers. No. Um, so don't listen to the audiobook with kids in the car. <laughs> no. No. Um, especially some scenes. But yeah. at the same time, they are... They're entertaining. They're, oh, definitely. And what I like is you can have a conversation about current events in relation to the novels yeah so they are definitely a guilty pleasure yes. um <laughs> they are fun you know i mean it's it's sci-fi romance which is right up my alley and you know they they have a place for in society and i think having that um outlet is good yes so. very much so all right. Um, I'm hope I'm not jumping the gun now. No, I think we're good. We're good. good. We're good. Okay. So we've kind of talked about some really heavy subjects. Um, now let's have some fun. Let's have some fun. We're gonna jump back to the first novel in the series, which I had um, already said. A senator's granddaughter is murdered. She was a licensed companion, and so of course her case deals with sex and sex workers and murder, and there are some dark things, but. One of the things that makes this book is the cast of characters. So let's go ahead and get started. Yes, we're casting this book. Yes. So one of the things that we did is we came up with a list of the main characters in the first book. And then we picked out a couple notable characters that do come in, in at least the second or third books that are huge to the stories. They, they are. They, they, may not, they may not be in the first book, but they are just as big a characters their core characters for the entirety of the series once they are introduced yes. so one thing that we did is we kind of picked a couple different people at most we're gonna be allowed to go on about one character if we have multiple casting choices we get one character to do that with other than that we have to pick one person that we want to play the role yeah and who knows maybe at the end we'll discuss it and put it in the description or something we will ultimately cast this movie out of what we've chosen yeah who knows so um i'm a firm believer in powerpoint we might put a powerpoint who up. Knows? <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're gonna start off with our mag leading lady eve dallas the kick-ass detective yes who would you pick to play her so i had multiple choices and <laughs> um the thing that i finally was finally settling on was Colby Smulders. So I <laughs> love her. She is so kick-ass as Maria Hill in the MCU Avengers and all of that. But she's also so fun in um, How I Met Your Mother. So she's got some interesting range. And I think that she is a lot of fun. I'm sorry, I'm just laughing because some of the things in my brain clips of How I Met Your Mother. I don't like that show, but it gets stuck in there. Um, so I'm going to call my chip in early and do my first one where I'm going to talk about all three of my choices. I know, I'm starting off with Eve. So my first choice, the one that came to mind very first when I was first listening and reading the books, this was several years ago. Mila Jovovich. Okay. So I, Resident Evil. Yeah. Resident Evil. She's done a lot of action sci-fi stuff in her career. Fifth Element. Mm -hmm. Classic. I love that movie. Um, I think that she has it in her to have that physicality. And the only thing that I don't think she could do really would probably be those comedic things because she's not really a comedian she's more of a kick butt actress which is why um, i went with chloe smolders because she could yeah. do the comedy and the kick butt i've just never seen her do the comedy so she could who knows i mean she did in fifth element there were some comedic there things. was 
Um, but she just has that energy about her that she could do it. Uh, my second pick, probably no surprise, Ruby Rose. She has it. She has it in her to play that kick ass, to have those vulnerable moments, and to really bring that character energy in. Um, so those are my top two. The one that I had a dream about recently, not that kind of dream, hold your horses, Scarlett Johansson. I love Scar Jo. She is fantastic. She could do it. She is, she's definitely maturing. I can't wait to see Black Widow. Oh, I know. Um, but my first time, so she actually popped on my radar years before Avengers and everything. Mm -hmm. um, Lost in Translation was she was so good in that. But actually, the one that really made me aware of her was Girl with a Pearl Earring. Oh, yes. That was such a good movie. So, anyway, she's fantastic. But, okay, so those are my three. I just, I think she's in her early to mid-30s. I'm not sure her exact age. That's about the same age as the character who is 29 to 35-ish um, throughout the series. Um, so, I just, I think she might be an interesting choice. If we're going main Hollywood. So. Yeah. Let's go next to Rourke, our capable man candy slash billionaire. And Bane slash love of Eve's life. Yes. So, um, this was definitely, I have a list of like 10. <laughs> um, Are you calling in your tip? Yeah. Okay. So, um, my first choice, like, like, first Wolverine um, film is definitely Hugh Jackman. He yes. sings, he dances, he does it all. Yes. Um, but he's just... Uh, delightful. Delightful. Um, my next is... Um, James Purfoy from Ooh. A Knight's Tale. Oh, he was also in The Following. The fo Oh, yeah. He oh, played he a great was back. so good in The Following. Um, but the one that I am actually going to go with is Tuatel Ojafor. Because oh, okay. he is beautiful, beautiful man. <laughs> and he's got a certain uh, seriousness about him, um, but he can also have fun. He has a very intense, a certain intensity about him. Um, the first time I remember seeing him was in Serenity um, from Firefly. But I also, he had just, um, there was a, a little bit of a whimsy about him in love actually yes so those were the two that just made me go hmm he is beautiful i can totally understand that um so one thing to know before i tell you mine is when we decided we were going to be casting we came up with the rule that there are no rules living dead whenever in their career you could pick them to play that role it's allowed um now for my casting choices i went more towards the descriptions in the book so mine are going to be kind of bland compared to yours i know it but my rourke colin o'donoghue who played hook oh. in once upon a time he Give him a little bit longer hair those eyes yeah he when he wears the the black eyeliner yes oh. the guy liner oh so nice so beautiful him and i think ruby rose would have wonderful chemistry oh that's an interesting pairing yeah interesting anyway that's mine so yeah okay i like it i <laughs> like it okay so now we're gonna go to ryan feeney he is Love eve. he is eve's ex-partner but he trained her on everything he is now the captain of the edd electronic detection division and um he is just a character but he's definitely eve's dad father figure father figure in that he he has become her dad mm -hmm. really like she trusts him implicitly he is the one that mm -hmm. brought her up helped her get into homicide and she's you know she's the kind of cop she's the cop she is because of ryan Feeney. exactly um i'll start with this one okay my choice john goodman Okay. Since he's gotten older, he's lost some weight. He has kind of a little bit of the jowl going on. He just screams 
seen it all, still dedicated to his job, but still wants to go home and watch the game, you know, kind of energy. Definitely. So I have, like, my choices here, and I am just, like... You called in your chip. You want to get to I one. know. Oh, I know. I <laughs> know. We'll be here all day. I know. Um, I am going with Jim Gaffigan. I love Jim Gaffigan. <laughs> he is so funny. He's so deadpan mm-hmm. and definitely has dad energy. Um, obviously, he has like five kids. Yeah. Um, but he he's just too fun. I love him. He's one of my favorite comedians. I can see it. Okay. Mavis Freestone is Eve's oh. best friend. Okay. So Mavis Freestone is probably one of my favorite characters. She is a former grifter who was arrested by Eve before she hit homicide and kind of just stuck around. And Mavis or Eve couldn't get rid of Mavis. Just, no. And at this point they see each other as sisters. They're the yeah. one person, no matter what happens. They're there for each other. They each had really rough upbringings. And exactly. they take care of each other in ways that, you know, I think people that have an easier upbringing don't quite understand. quite understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I decided Zendaya. Okay. One of the things about Mavis that I adore is her extreme tastes when it comes to her profession she is a singer um and in the beginning of the book she is a headliner at this dive called the blue squirrel and that's where she's been singing forever and so there's at one point a scene where she's literally only wearing body paint and tasteful things to cover her goodies um and by tasteful i mean tiny (laughs) and that's kind of her style she changes her hair like every few days sometimes and it's just she has that outlandish style and I think that Zendaya could do it she has the ability especially when she did Malcolm and Marie I think is what it's called on Netflix it's that black and white one that I was telling you about um where she she just has such an amazing and interesting tone in that film that I think she could bring something great to this role Okay. I am going with Kate McKinnon. I love Kate McKinnon. (laughs) Well, her ability on SNL, man. She plays every different um, uh, impersonation that she does is spot on. Her RBG, her HRC, I mean, her Giuliani, every... Each one is so freaking hysterical i love her and she when she commits she commits there is no question about it absolutely um i think that would be an interesting choice yeah let's talk nadine first so she is the crack reporter at channel 75 Channel, channel 75 she is on the crime beat and oh so dedicated to her job Yes. To the point where her and Eve kind of butt heads a lot, especially in the beginning. But they become friends and they rely on each other. Mm-hmm. And one of the fun things, I'm sorry, we're kind of spoiling it, giving a couple of little spoilers here and there. Um, she ends up writing a book and the very first person she has read her book is Eve. Yeah, because they, she wants that feedback from somebody that she trusts. Mm-hmm. I have some awesome people on my list, not going to lie. But I am going with Ming-Na Wen. I mean... Okay. She is spectacular. Yes. Like, who... From Mulan to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to Mandalorian. And she's just like, <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't say enough about her. Yes, I've heard you rhapsodize. Um... I'm going to say Sasha Alexander. Okay. So from um, NCIS. NCIS, Brazilian Isles. Um, she just, she has that dogged reporter energy to me. And she, like, especially in, like, Brazilian Isles, she's always glossy and put together. And she very rarely 
has moments where she isn't spot on with her appearance and her comportment. And it just, Nadine has that energy. So I think that that would be a good pairing. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So Charlotte Mira. Okay. Charlotte is the NYPSD shrink who she is a huge part of Eve's life. One where Eve, at the beginning, is very reluctant reluctant to go see her, especially considering her past. She has repressed it. She doesn't want to think about it. And whenever she sees Mara, she's forced to confront that about herself. And things start to come back from when she was a child. And eventually it gets to that point where Charlotte becomes sort of a mother-like figure to Eve. And she cares so much about Eve and she actually at one point says that she hopes Eve will think of her in that role as kind of a in mom. that way um, as a it, mother figure it's so funny even her own children Charlotte's children one of them is very jealous of Eve because Charlotte treats her like her child in some aspects yeah but I just I love love her character she's so fun okay who are you, who I'm gonna she? say Jane Seymour. She was the first person I ever pictured in the role when I was first starting out in the series and I think that she could do it because Charlotte is always what's the word I'm thinking of? Put together. She's on top of things but she's gentle and soft in a lot of ways. Jane Seymour has that classic. Very classy. Classic classy and classy. Lady. Yeah. So that's kind of where I see Mira. It's very classy, very dedicated, very kind. Excellent. So, um, this, I have a tendency to choose very British actors because. You well, have a thing about British people. I do. Um, apparently, I'm a closet Brit. A Bibli. Brit, Brit, what do they call them? Ingle. Bing. Bibli. Bing. I can't remember. Anyway. We can Anglophile? Cut Anglophile. Anglophile. There we go. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so I am going with Adjoa Ando. I totally butchered her name, um, mm-hmm. but she was Lady Danbury in Bridgerton. We stand Lady Danbury in this yes. house. I am sorry. If you do not like her, get out. <laughs> um, she was stunning, and I loved her in that. Yeah, I think my favorite line I've ever heard her say was I was afraid or I was frightened so I made myself the most frightening thing in the room and she just radiates that energy and I can see that would be an amazing choice yeah one I'm going to put a pin in our discussion real quick and just say one of the things that I really enjoy about the in-depth world is everybody is mixed race pretty much all of the suspects are mixed race all of everybody that being said, the main cast is kind of white bread. I'm glad to see a lot more diversity, especially in your casting choices, because I didn't. I went by the book. You're taking more initiative with that, and I kind of wish I had. So, anyway, unpin, continue. Okay. So, Lawrence Somerset. <laughs> he is the bane of Eve's existence. He is Rourke's major domo slash father figure. Like, he's yeah. basic, you know, they have a good relationship and he loves to nitpick at Eve they are like cats and dogs oil and water yeah they do not get along but they have become very protective they're because they're both very protective of Rourke Mm -hmm. they start forming a small alliance and when Eve as, as the series goes on when Eve if if Eve is having a bad day and doesn't snipe um at um somerset he will then go find rourke and say there is something wrong go fix it (laughs) i love that about him he's like you see him as like the crypt keeper honestly um i i love him because he when he became part of rourke's life he was coming out of a darker past and then some huge tragedy happens I can't say because it's a big spoiler we won't do that we won't do that to you guys but it made him see specifically what he wanted for Rourke 
Eve is not what he wanted. But at this point, they kind of, they've come to accept each other. They'll do anything to make sure the other one is safe because they know it's not for them. It's for Rourke. Everything is for Rourke for the two of them when it comes to each other. Yeah. But they'll still take care of each other even if they snipe at each other. I am going to choose Charles Dance. Okay. So Tywin Lannister. Yes. Um, I, I'm i breaking the rule. I'm sorry. I would have said Christopher Lee. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to break the rule. I had to throw another name in there. But Terry Stan- or, um, not Terry Stan- Charles Dance has the right energy for that. Well, the, like, if you think about the first time you meet him in Game of Thrones, yes. he is literally skinning a deer. And he learned how to do that for that film, for mm-hmm. that show. And he's really skinning a deer. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, yeah. Yeah. Who would you choose? I am going with Alan Rickman because we stand Alan Rickman too. He is yes. he is one of those actors that no matter what, if the movie's on TV and he's in it, it stays on even if I'm just cleaning my house. You know, of course, every um, you know American audiences were first introduced to him as Hans Gruber <laughs> in Die Hard, which is my favorite Christmas movie, of course. Yes. Um, but he is just. He's, he's got a certain energy, and he, you know, sometimes he's a good guy, sometimes he's a bad guy, but whatever he's doing... He has gravitas. He does. Um, and I know you threw out an extra name, so my Go for it. my other one is Patrick Stewart. Oh, I hadn't thought about that one. Okay. I like that one. Okay, okay. Um, let's go ahead and talk Jack Whitney. Uh, Jack Whitney is the commander of the Homicide Division of the uh, Cough Central, which is the main precinct in New York. Um, and uh, he... There's only one man for him. We both agree. This has been... Uh, we have dreamcast him. Like, as soon as we said it, we were both just like, there's no one else. No one else. Idris Elba. Mm, delicious man. Oh, yes. Like would climb that man like a tree. Just saying throwing that energy out there just just a little bit <laughs> okay so now we're getting to our bad guy this is the um chief of the nypsd he only is in this book mm-hmm. he gets fired yeah we're not saying anything you don't know mm-hmm. because we're going to talk about his replacement later yes but he is a big part of this first book because he um, kind of puts his foot in it because the, the like I said the victim is a senator's granddaughter and instead of you know doing his job as the police chief and keeping all of the information you know internal he allows the senator complete access to the case and to the lead detective and that just is a bad deal bad, bad drive. his name is Edward Simpson Chief Edward Simpson and I honestly wanted to punch him in the face and if you could do that with a fictional character, oh, he would be so punched. Yep. I'm going with another one of my British choices. I'm going Timothy Dalton. Oh, okay. Because if you, like, of course, I, the first time I saw him was in uh, Flash Gordon <laughs> um, as Prince. One of your favorite films of all time. It is. Um, Prince Baron. But I love him in Hot Fuzz where he's the bad guy and he smiles and the ding goes off because that's <laughs> he's just that energy Timothy Dalton what can you oh, go yeah. for? this is the only one where I did not stick with the book description there's a reason for that when I say the name you're going to be like oh oh okay yeah Tilda Swinton oh yeah she's she's got that androgynous thing going on yeah well she's she's been cross cast before mm-hmm. um if the ancient one think from uh, uh dr strange mm-hmm. um but yeah she's definitely got that interesting energy there oh most definitely i think that one of my favorite films that tilda swinton's been in um not mcu is probably the only love left alive with tom hiddleston and they play vampires and just that timeless, ageless 
energy kind of just works in this particular role. Okay, I like it. Okay, so now let's talk Senator de Blas. Ugh. He is a bad guy. I hate senators. I'm sorry. I've never met a good one. Um, I know that they exist somewhere. I just have not. We're not real thrilled with the ones in the state of Utah. No. We're not going to go politics, so let's just stick with the world of the book. Yes. I'm going to throw out John Malkovich. Oh, I love John Malkovich. <laughs> he is now at that age where he could play this role. He is. He is. And he, like, he has it in him to be that serious, no-nonsense, oily politician. Oh, yeah. I think that he would be a good choice. Oh, yeah. I am going... Um, it's... Um, <laughs> I am going Tom Wilkinson. Oh. I love him. He is such, again, the British thing. Um, sometimes he's so sweet in some films, um, but then he, the first time I saw him, he played the bad guy in Girl in a Pearl Earring. There's a theme here. Yes. Um, and I was like, oh, he's amazing as a bad guy. And he just has that oily, creepy factor happening. Absolutely. Of course, you know, then he's, of course, in uh, Carm Carmine Falcone and Batman Begins as well, so. That's true. I could list many things. Let's move into Senator de Blas's right-hand man got his head shoved so far up the senator's butt uh, that if he coughed, the senator would cough. Uh, his name is Derek Brockman. And he is just, <sighs> he's so slick. He thinks he's so slick. Yeah. He... I'm going to say Billy Zane. Oh, he has that very, especially uh, Titanic. Oh, yeah. Like, if you, you don't want to touch him because he's that kind of, ugh, geeky is the word my grandmother would use is the word geeky. Uh, he could do that. He's played some really interesting characters, um, especially like when he did his little short arc on Charmed. I love the character that he was, the redeemed demon, that kind of thing. Um, but I think that he could play this role because he's kind of done it before. Not to this extent, but I think he could do it. Okay. I'm going with D.B. Sweeney. I mean, we love him from Cutting Edge, but when he was in Jericho, he played such a slime ball. That he, I, I've seen him play a bad guy, and he's really good at it. I, I have to agree with you. Um, okay, let's do the last one of the main cast. That is Charles Monroe. He is a smooth-talking licensed companion who is a suspect for three point five seconds, and he has a kind of a crush on Eve. Yes. So. Who would you pick to play him? So I am going with Gary Carr. Now he might not be a, a name that you're familiar with, but if you have ever seen Death in Paradise, he is the young up and coming police officer. And there's a certain sweetness about him. And he is very earnest mm -hmm. and wants to do a good job. And he has this just this really soft energy. He's a cop, will do his job, but like he goes above and beyond and, but won't let anybody know that he does it. So in that- Ooh, in I that, can see that. I can so see that, especially with Charles. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna say Henry Cavill. Hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry, The Witcher just- There's something delicious about that. There's something right there. Yeah. We're not drooling or no, anything. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, no, he has he has the right energy to play the licensed companion, to be the beefcake on your arm at an event in society, but he also, he totally could be the dominant one in a relationship, but he has that energy where he will allow the person that he's with to be the initiator, the dominant one, and he's not threatening in any capacity. Um, he could be. I mean, but Henry Cavill is certainly. Whew. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so that is the main cast of the book. Um, 
let's go on to our notable characters. These are the characters who are huge in the series. Um, and let's start with Peabody. So Delia Peabody, become, she shows up in book two. She is a huge, huge part of the series. She is Eve's, starts as Eve's assistant. Aid. Aid. Then becomes her partner. So basically she is Eve's protege. And she is to Eve what Eve was to Eden. Yeah, really. That's a good way to put it. Um, but she is, she has, she's that kind of person that she exudes when she needs to express grief for somebody. She can relate. She's not afraid to show that. She has that humanity. But she's also empathy. like not soft. By any stretch of the imagination. She has it in her to be. She was raised as a free ager, which is kind of like a hippie slash New vegan age. kind of person. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not sorry, I'm not knocking vegans in any shape or form. No. I'm just saying she radiates vegan energy. Right. But she's also a smart ass. <laughs> she definitely is. In the beginning, she's so scared. She's just terrified of sassing Eve. And then later on, he's she's like, I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> because she stands up. Mm -hmm. Which is, that sass part is why I chose Kat Dunnings. Okay. I can see it. Um, I love her. I Two Broke Girls was one of my favorite shows for a while there. It's very problematic. Very crass. Um, but she was so cute in... Um, WandaVision. WandaVision. And, and Thor. Thor. And I watch a lot of the MCU stuff. Well, just you're saying. going through a phase, so we will just... I mean, you're wearing your Captain America shirt. It is what it is. Team Cap. <laughs> uh, Team Iron Man. That explains so much. Right? <laughs> um, so for my Peabody, I chose Mae Whitman. Okay. She's got that sturdy energy about her, but she radiates... Oh, this is I'm I'm here for you kind of energy, um, dedicated, dogged, ready to go down, fighting, you know, and I just I really do enjoy that. I think that oh, I just, she radiates energy for me. Okay. Ian McNabb, Peabody's main squeeze, and Feeney's boy, his protege in the electronic detention electronic detection division. Uh, he look. He is described as the fashion plate of the EDD. Basically, he, if you were to dress him, it would be like the 80s throw up. Yeah, except for not so much hair poofage. No. Probably the only not thing. I'm going to go with Thomas Brody Sangster. Okay. He definitely has that um, eternal youth thing going on that he has. Yeah. So I... Um, I'm going with a young John Oliver. I love John Oliver. You have an obsession with John Oliver. I do. Um, not, and I'm thinking daily show John Oliver, even though I, don't get me wrong, I watched last week tonight on a religious basis. <laughs> but when he was in uh, daily show, he was just awkward and he's still awkward, but it works for him. It works. And I love John Oliver. Okay. How about Baxter? He is, basically, he's become Eve's second in command of her the division. division. Um, kind of described as a fashion plate. He's a smooth-talking detective who is a ladies' man, and he knows that he's got it going on. Yeah. I'm going with Oded Fair. Of the That's mother. cheating? It can't be cheating. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't put anybody off limits. <laughs> I know. It's not in the rule book. That's cheating. Because I didn't think of it. Because <laughs> he is. Mm. He is. He is. I'm. Oh, God. I'm like, my cat ears. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a black cat and I wear these to mock him. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I think yeah. the wine's getting to me. Just a um, bit. I'm gonna go with Tom Hardy. Okay. He just he has that certain suave the suave energy. So are we thinking Venom? Oh, Mad totally, Max. Okay. Totally Venom. Okay. 
that's what brought him to my attention for sure. Okay. Um, I did like Fury Road, but this, this okay. isn't really it. All right, let's move on to Troy True Heart, who becomes Baxter's aide and eventual partner. And he is, with a name like True Heart, he is the epitome of his name. He is young, green, but not naive. He is so dedicated. He just wants to be a good cop. And he has worked his way up to where he's at now. I'm going to say young Jared Padalecki. Okay. Like, first season of so, uh, Supernatural. Supernatural. Yeah. Okay. I just... And then he grew up to be so fine. But we're not going to talk about him anymore. No. Your turn. Um, so mine is, again, another one that you might not be completely familiar with. Um, the first time I saw him was actually, he had like one line in uh, Avengers. But then he got cast in Agent Carter as um, one of the member founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. And that's Onver Gojak. I'm again there's a few people on here that I'm like I'm totally butchering their names um but he has especially um like that baby face energy and I can it. so all right we're gonna move on to Chief Harrison Tibble who ends up replacing Chief Simpson after the first book and he is in my favorite expression a damn fine man he takes care of his people he will do everything he can if his people are doing their job and in the right he will do everything to support them yeah and i chose lawrence fishburne oh yeah he is you know matrix uh morpheus morpheus yeah he's good um, I have two, and I'm actually changing mine. I am going with Forrest Whitaker. Oh, okay. I like your choice. I think that they both would do great in that role. They just, Forrest Whitaker just has that certain je ne sais quoi about him that's... I can dig it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Leonardo. He is the gentle giant. He falls in love with Mavis. He's a fashion designer. And what he designs for Mavis is so out there that Eve is afraid of whenever he designs for clothing. But he always tailors it to her her style, her body type, that kind of thing. He's, that, he's just a good designer. And he is the sweetest man. He will literally confess to murder to protect Mavis. Mavis, even if he didn't do anything. Um... I'm going to say the late Chadwick Boseman. Oh. I think he would have done a great job. Yeah. I am going with Edie Gathiki. Okay. From Twilight. He dreads Laurent. Yes. Okay. Yeah, he has that energy. I can see it. I like your choice. Okay, next. We're going to talk about the only person that Eve is actually af- afraid of. Um, <laughs> this is her personal body and style consultant. Yes. Um, she, like, as soon as she works on Eve, she's like, this is my face. It's your face, but it's mine now. And, like, she's been known to get revenge when Eve doesn't put the face gunk on. And whenever Eve goes after her hair with scissors, she gets pissed. It's hilarious. Um, I'm... I'll let you pick yours first. Um, I have always seen Leslie Jones for SNL. I love her. Okay, okay, I see it. She's just. I'm gonna say Lizzo. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear the news? Like she slipped in Chris Evans DMs no. over the weekend, apparently, and has been talking about that. So it was like, I'm all for it. I love Lizzo. I think she's such a fun artist. And she would definitely bring that energy. Yeah. Um, now, let's let's talk about your favorite character. So, Dennis Mira is um, Charlotte Mira's husband. He is not dumb. I mean, he's a professor at Columbia. Mm-hmm. Columbia? Yeah, Columbia. He's a little absent-minded. A lot absent-minded. <laughs> um, but he cares for Eve so much. Um 
he he was hurting but saw that e it was cold outside and eve needed a hat and so she still wears that hat she is embarrassed by that hat because it is blue it has, has a snowflake, snowflake on it, it. and he, he said hang on and he disappears and he comes back and he gives her a pair of gloves and a hat. And he actually, he sits there and he grabs her hand and he puts it on her. And pulls the hat. It's like such dad energy. And it's it adorable. And she has a bit of a crush on him. Like, just like a harmless, you know, mm -hmm. crush. He just, he melts her heart. And mm -hmm. she doesn't have that very often. Yeah. Um, and I have several people on here, but there's just something about Taika Waititi. Um, okay. He, especially um, the rock, oh, what's his name, from Thor Ragnarok. He's, <laughs> you know. I, I started a revolution, but I forgot to tell people. Pretty much. And that's the energy that Dennis uh, has. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, but Taika Waititi in general is just, he bounces, but he also has, he comes across as sometimes a little, a lot absent-minded. Yes. I can see that. I can so see that. Um, I chose Jeremy Irons. Okay. I don't necessarily see him as like the absent minded, minded part. part. Yeah. I think he could do it. I just I love him. I think he there's something so comforting about him. His voice. I mean, he's he's done some really awful characters. Yeah. But I think that he just has it. Yeah, okay. Alright. So we are done with the casting. If you guys agreed with our casting choices or if you have suggestions, if you've read the series, let us know who you would like to play these roles. But next, for the wrap up, we're gonna talk about our five favorite books, not including the first three, which we do highly recommend. So I've got mine numbered, the ones I chose. Let's just see who has the lowest number and go through the order. Okay. I have number 17. Okay, I have 21. All right, I will go first. <laughs> Imitation in Death, book 17. This one is about a man who is emulating various serial killers from the mm. past. Okay. And I just, this is such a fun one, especially considering, you know, where technology is and time is now. But, like, he emulates Jack the Ripper at certain point, at one point, and it's just... I really enjoyed that book. Okay. So mine is book 21. I have that on my list as well. Okay. Origin and Death. Um, this is um, really embraces the sci-fi. And it is um, called, kind of, you'll hear the name, The Icoves. The Icove Agenda. Um, it's all about clones. And I think that's all we should say about that because it is so. There's the twist at the end is just like, it's amazing. Damn, <laughs> it's it's an amazing story, and it has such a huge part in every book after that. For a while, people talk about it all the time. We'll get into that in a little bit, but it's just, uh, I love that one. Uh, the next one I have is twenty four. I do too. Okay, Innocent in Death. This is one of those ones that just kind of sticks with you. It's a little unsettling. Because a lot unsettling. I, yeah. <laughs> um, a teacher at a private school is poisoned. And they're trying to figure out who did it. And I, I want to spoil it so bad. Should we? No, we're not spoiling it. Just read that one. Um, the person <laughs> who did it is a sociopath yeah and disturbing on so many levels mm -hmm. and it will haunt you yeah all right next what number do you have 32 me too <laughs> i'm noticing a theme here and i think it's because i think some of the favorite books are the ones that that when there's that crossover, they the stand out. They stand out. And they stick with you. Mm -hmm. These are the, like, the whole series is good. But then there's ones that are even better. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, 32 is 
treachery in death. And this is um, the first time that Peabody gets to run a case all by herself. Um, but there's a problem and she feels bad because she's not as physically fit as she needs to be. So she goes, she doesn't want to work out where all of the main cops are because... She calls them meatheads. Meatheads, but she's also self-conscious, I think, about yeah. her body and everything. And so she goes to the old gym and runs into, like, she's lucky she survives. It's bad. It's really bad. So th- that makes it sound like she was attacked. No. Yeah. But she witnesses corruption. At the highest levels. In the police department. Mm -hmm. And if she had been caught, she would have lost her life. Yeah. And uh, I love that one. I just love the strength that we get to see in Peabody. There's a lot of growth with her character. And it kind of just cements home for me why she's one of my favorites. Yeah. And just her tackling the corruption is just, I love it. Yeah. All right. What's your last one? What number? Number 42. My next one's 34. Okay. Okay. So number 34 is called Celebrity in Death. This one's a callback to the iCove books, or the, the book about the iCoves, which was Origin in Death. Um, in this one, Nadine First has written a book about the iCove case. It's called The iCove Agenda, and it was turned into a film. And they're on... The, they're at the rap party at this big mansion and one of the actors playing a very key character is murdered while everybody is there and so it becomes this big whodunit and it's hollywood glitz and glamour and it just it entertains me so much it's one of my favorites um and i think my favorite of all of them is 42 which is brotherhood and death oh that's a good one so this is about Probably because it's Den- it's got Dennis Mira. He is, um, he's the main character. He's the he's the main victim in this. He discovers an unpleasant family secret, and there is a big conspiracy, and he is forced to admit that everything he knew about some uh, a member of his family is not true and he's horrified by the the revelations i know that's vague but that's okay because it's really good yeah all of these books every book in the series is good if they're entertaining they're fun they have their funny moments they have their serious moments there are some that are horrifying and stick with you but there are some that just make you laugh the whole way through and I mean, there's nothing more you can really ask for in this kind of a series that's gone on for so many books. We're still, like, we're anxiously waiting for the next one to come out. Yeah, the last one came out in February. The next one doesn't come out until later this year. And we're just like, okay, Nora. Anytime. (laughs) Anytime now. Um, I think the fact that we are anxiously awaiting the series shows how attached you can become to characters as much it's like any other you know fandom where you are you love the characters and you love their Mm -hmm. growth and you love the challenges that they go through and you want to know what the next adventure is going to be i agree completely and i think that this is one that i'm probably going to return to many years to come There's something to be said when you're anticipating a release after something that's been so long and gone on so long. This series has staying power. Yeah. I've now listened to the entire series twice. Three times for me. (laughs) It's a guilty pleasure. It's something, and I've mentioned this on my personal channel several times, I never rate this series critically because there are flaws, obviously. There are flaws with everything. There are things that I don't agree with, especially with the whitewashing of certain characters and things like that which I did not help with with my casting, but I stuck with the books. Anyway, I think that I lost my train of thought. <laughs> there are moments, th- nothing is perfect. Exactly. There, there, there are, yeah, everything has, can be potentially problematic, but 
they are not so problematic that makes you go, I can't ever enjoy that again because Mm -hmm. they the series is so engaging and we love the characters and for me i've not read the series i've only ever listened to it and it's keeping entertaining it is and i hear the voices and thank you susan erickson you're a gem and how she interprets all of the characters and how you know like i hear them now they're Mm -hmm. they're part of my psyche and like if I were to just listen to um, Susan read like read a line from each of the characters, I could tell which character it is. I mm-hmm. there's that. Absolutely, I think she does such a great job with Tibble and Trina and Rourke and Peabody. This is something to be said. I identify as asexual, so it kind of throws me for a loop when she does Rourke, and I'm just like, oh, that's sexy. Oh wait. <laughs> Oh wait, okay, that's okay. <laughs> you know, I have to like knock the hetero out of myself every once in a while. <laughs> Just saying. Um, anyway, yeah. I think that this has been a kind of a fun video. It's a long one. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. We've gone over a lot of information, but we hope it was engaging. And yeah. we're gonna be we're excited to do more of this. <laughs> we have a list. We do definitely have a list. I think that. I've missed filming with you. I miss filming with you too. So I love you. Hand hug. Hand hug. <laughs> so um, mine will be on. I will edit mine. Meg's gonna edit hers. They'll be on our respective channels. We'll link. Yes. The, we'll cross link um, um, in our descriptions. Be sure to subscribe to Meg's. Be sure to subscribe to Tammy's. And uh, thank you all for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. If you liked these videos, give them a thumbs up because we love the attention. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> give them a thumbs up. And if you like seeing us talk about books or films or if you want to go check out our individual channels, they'll be linked down below so you can go do that. Think of subscribing to our channels and we will see you in our next video. Bye. Bye.